Hello everybody, I'm John Hayes and tonight we're doing our second portion of our gear rundown. And before we get started, I want to tell you a quick story. So several years ago, I had the opportunity to play guitar with Anti-Scene for a show here in Charlotte. And um, I remember at that show learning two songs and going on stage and playing the hell out of the guitar. Just really sawing away at that guitar and looking across the stage at Joe Young and Joe's hands were barely moving and Joe grinned at me and I was just in awe trying to figure out exactly what was going on that night but I did find out and the secret and something I think that very few people know about Anti-Scene is that much of the groove and much of the sound that's coming from that band is coming from our guest tonight and our guest tonight is Sir Barry Hamill. Barry, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Well, I'm very happy to have you. Um, and that is a very true story, folks. Um, Barry, tell us a little bit about your musical journey. So uh, the intent of this is to tell the fans uh, a little bit about you, your musical journey. And what many people want to know is, is your history with Anti-Scene. But let's start back a little bit earlier than that about your musical beginnings. And then we'll, we'll arc into Anti-Scene talk about how you got in the band, um, your gear, and some stories along the way. So in the beginning, tell us a little bit about your musical journey. Where did you start? And did you start with bass guitar? Did you start with another instrument? Uh, well, I've always been a drummer. And uh, when I was a little English boy, I wanted to be a drummer. And mom and dad would never buy me a set of drums. So I never got my drum set. Uh, we moved to America. I never got my drum set. I had a little cutout of the red sparkly Sears Roebuck drums on my wall. Sure. I saw as close as I got to a drum set until I was 18, and I got a job and bought me a drum set. But and was that your first instrument? That's when that you was first my started first playing instrument. Music? And uh, here in I'm, the U.S. Here in the U.S. Okay. in uh, 1985. Now you're obviously known in anti scene for bass guitar now. Right. But the earliest incarnation with you in anti scene, I was the drummer. You were the drummer. Yeah, years, yeah. For 12 so, years. So for 12, quite some time. Yeah. So your first set of drums, 18, did you take lessons? Did you play? I on never your took own? lessons. I grew up playing To Kiss Alive with pillows on the couch. Right. So when I got that drum set, I mean, I knew how to play them. Right. I just had to work on my foot. But. Besides that, my, I had a neighbor that had a drum set. Right. Okay. So I got to fuck around on that. Sure. Mess around on that. And, uh, of course, it was his drum set. So he would play the drums all the time. So I would play his brother's guitar. Okay. So that's how that ended up. Okay. Later on, as I uh, once I felt I had my chops up enough to go play in a band. Right. And I realized... If you're a drummer or a bass player, you will always be employed. That's good advice, folks. That is good advice. That's <laughs> very good it advice. Is. If you play drums and bass, you will always have a job. True. Okay. So, so, so drums, you were playing guitar with your friend. You are playing your friend's guitar while he was playing his drums. Right. So did you learn to play guitar? Did you take lessons with that? You just I did around? learn to play guitar, too. Okay. I did have a few guitars, mm -hmm. and I did take guitar lessons here and then. But I'm pretty much self-taught in everything I do. Gotcha. Now, did that early guitar experience help or hinder with bass? Many people play the bass, many guitar players play the bass like a guitar. And it's not necessarily the correct way to play a bass yeah, guitar not, in no. a band setting. No. So, so that didn't really color the way you play bass because you saw yourself as a drummer at that time? I'm, I'm, I'm still a drummer. You're still a drummer. I am a drummer. That's what I am. Okay. So I play drums on the bass. That's what I do now. So okay. That's how it's approached. All right. So let let's talk a little bit about that. So you 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 started playing drums, played a little bit of guitar. What was your first band? What did you do in that band? I, did you write songs? Did you sing? Did you just play drums? What, what? Well, my friend that I grew up with that had the drum set. Yeah. Got in a band called Bloody Mary. Okay. Sure. They needed a vocalist. I became Bloody Mary's vocalist. I left that band for a while. I got married young. I got divorced young. <laughs> Okay. Joined back as Bloody Mary, they needed a bass player. So there was a void that needed to be filled, and 
I what do you know about bass players and drummers? They're, they're always employed. Yeah, That's they need right. a bass player. Right. So I was the Bloody Mary bass player. And that was really the only other band I played in. Okay. Now, Bloody Mary kind of run its course. Sure. And uh, the job came open to play drums in anti -sync. Okay. So let's talk about that. So you were the singer. Then you were the bass, bass player, player, although you were a drummer. But the job came open mm -hmm. in anti -sync. And we've been playing with Bloody Mary. Been playing with Anti Scene. I've been seeing Anti Scene, you know, since the beginning. So you knew each other to some degree. Yeah. So so how does one approach a, another band being known as a bass player to become a drummer in the other band? Was that is that awkward or is it how does that work out? Well, I just called, told him I wanted to audition, and I think he was kind of taken aback, didn't know I was a drummer, but right. And, uh, so, and, so you went through an audition process? I auditioned, yeah. A lot of people auditioned, and I and you and got, I got the job, yeah. So when you get into Anti Scene, so now we're in the arc of Anti Scene, and that was 1994. So 1994, oh. you were in the band as a drummer yeah. for how many years? From 94 to 2006, I was a drummer. So you were in the band for a very long time as a drummer. So at what point in the arc of Anti Scene did you join? So let's talk about. Albums. What what album or tour did you did you come into the picture so that people can associate they that with what you just finished Hell. Okay. And I replaced Greg. Mm -hmm. So the first thing we did was a few singles. Cactus Jack single was my first single. Right. And then my first album was Here Ruin Your Group. So here's an interesting question that I just thought of. Today, much of the background, if not all the background singing for anti scene, and there is a fair amount. Comes from you. Did you sing while you played drums early on in your career? I did. Yeah. So you did. Okay. Yeah. So you. Did. I did the same backups I do now. I did just play on the drums. Yeah. Okay. So. so so during that period, it's a very long period of time. Um, obviously, you played with with many members of the band at that oh, during yeah. that period. Um, what? Why the break from drums at that point, and and what happened at that point? In the, the anti-scene arc, what happened at, at the end of your run on drums? Um, well, I just come to a point in my life where I, I just uh, I needed to secure my future job-wise, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I'd been working for a family-owned business the whole time, and I was able to just leave and go on tour whenever I wanted to, right. and I just needed to kind of step back and do a reset. Sure, and, uh, and we see that all the time yeah. with with young musicians that. At some point, you have to take care of your family, yeah. but, but you know you still have a passion for the right. music that you have. And once that was reset, the bass player position come open. And, and who did you replace at that point? At that place, I replaced John Bowman. Okay. So playing drums with Anti Scene for that long, yeah. I started. Uh, Tom O'Keefe was the bass player. I've been watching him play forever, anyway. But you get a whole different view from sitting from the drum stool, right? Sure. So, I got to watch Tom play bass for them a couple of years. Right. And then Trip McNeil replaced him. Mm -hmm. So I went from the full bar chords, you know, uh, power chords that Tom would play. Right. To this Trip was actually a guitar player. Right. So then I got to see this kind of you know intricate playing. Right. And then from there, I watched uh, Joe Williams took his place. Mm -hmm. Now, Joe Williams is that was that's one of the most underappreciated lineups as far as live performance. I think as far as the band, right? As far as the rhythm section, drums and bass. Gotcha. Because uh, man, he was just he was in the pocket, and I, and he was locked on to me. And after that, there was Doug. Mm -hmm. And from Doug, kind of after, after Trip and Joe, Doug kind of brought it back, simplified everything. Right. And that's got its spots too, because that's sure. uh, when you talk about playing guitar and anti scene. The the big thing is what not to do. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And so Doug knew what not to do. Right. And uh, and he had the great backing vocals. Right. That helped. So that's another thing. It certainly adds something to any band that have backing vocals yeah. for, for whatever so that was it. So I took the best 
from sitting at that drum stool, you know, I took the best little parts of all the things that I, I thought locked in with right. the drummer from each of those guys and kind of, you know, just ripped them all off. Right. And just, that's and what, do what I, you do. Now. And do what I do, which is, you know, a little bit of all of them guys. An underlying current in anti scene that sounds like a guitar. Right. But it is the bass. Right. And you can only tell it. If you go to a show, and I highly recommend you go to an anti-scene show and stand in front of Sir Barry Hannibal and watch what he does because it is uh, remarkable. It's remarkable how you play. So that education that you got for those years certainly patterned itself on what you do today. Now, speaking of what you do today, let's talk about your gear just a little bit. So I, I see that you, you're playing an Epiphone bass, yeah. uh, four string bass, um, why not five? Why not six? Because uh, that's just fucking ridiculous. I mean, <laughs> four, you need four strings, you know? <laughs> McCartney needed four, Lemmy needs four. I don't need more than four. Um, but this is my bass, man. I bought this Epiphone Ripper until I could afford to get a Gibson. Yeah. And then once I started with it, I mean, I don't need no Gibson. This is this has done me fine. I had some active EMGs put in it, mm -hmm. and uh, you know I got my Blonde Ripper is a, is a backup bass. Sure. And but man, whenever I'm playing anything else, this, I'm just wishing I was playing this. So this is just my bass. Right now, as a guitar player, we we experience broken strings, especially mm -hmm. if you're heavy-handed. It is not a common occurrence, I don't think, on a bass guitar, but you do have a backup. I do. And it is your backup because of broken just, strings? It's just there yeah. just in case. Just in case. Okay. Now let's talk a little bit about this specific guitar. We had talked earlier about what you like about the neck, but let's start at the pickups. Active pickups versus passive. What, what do you see in your tone, one versus the other, or is it just a preference of yours to have active versus passive pickups in your bass guitar? Well, the Blonde has passive, and... You know, the, this whole rig here, I don't need much versatility in this rig. Right. It's, there's not much versatility in our music. It's, you know, it's one gear, pedal to all the way to the floor. So, just response, when I've got the active and i got my everything going, just right. the response I get, it just feels right. Gotcha. And, uh, you know, it may not be, it may be I just think it feels right or sounds well, better. that's what music's about. That's what it is about. Absolutely. So, um, so, so. You've got, it, it, both of your guitars are Epiphones. Yeah. Um, I see on this guitar and I think on your Bond guitar strap locks. Yeah. Ever had an issue without them where you drop the guitar or is this just something that you I've never make played. you feel better? I've, I've never played without strap locks because I'm a goddamn professional. <laughs> I, I, saw that on, that. I saw that on your shirt one time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. so now your bass guitar, now let's move to your amplification because this is a beast of um, an amplifier. Walk us through this because um, your stage volume is almost legendary. Um, talk about your head and then your speaker cabinet. This is a, a, a little different than your traditional yeah. um, Mesa well, 810 or whatever. How this all started, this was actually Doug Knipe's cabinet. No kidding. He never used it in anti-scene. Right. But uh, I rescued it. He had it on consignment and I rescued it. <laughs> and I'm sure he's forgot about it, but I never actually paid him for it. Sorry, Doug. Yeah, sorry, but I've got about $400 in replacing speakers, so if he wants it back now, he has to buy it from me. <laughs> but uh, Fair enough. The only reason I have this mess of boogie head is just because I like things to match. I like things to match. Many people have gone to solid state base amps. Right. That, there is some response difference, but there's definitely a tonal difference. Yeah. Um, people will say there's not, but there is. There's no yeah. doubt there is. Um, this thing you could probably fry eggs on during a gig. Yeah. Do you have a preference tube amps versus solid state? Is there, well, do you in this or, band, I had a solid state Fender head for for a while, mm -hmm. and in this band, I could be playing on a big stage with the best money PA can buy one night. And being a dive bar the next night, where the only thing they're micing's, uh, you know, sure vocals, right, and and kick and snare. So, 
sometimes in in places like that, or even on a big stage, I, with that solid state, I and the power it was a Fender two hundred and fifty, right? Um, I would just lose it on stage. I, I just it was just I didn't have no headroom, right? So this just serves, and um, the problem with this thing is you can't turn it down, right? I mean, one is outrageous. And uh, my, my stage volume is a little excessive sometimes, but. Depends about the tits on the room. Yeah, but. but uh, that's what the PA is for. Yeah, that's right. Right. But, uh, so, so let's walk down for a second. 400 watt tube. Yeah, 12 power tubes, four preamp tubes. Right, which goes back to frying eggs and, yeah. you know, fried chicken on the top. Now, let's go down to your pedals because there's, traditionally in bass guitar, your sound is here, mm -hmm. um, and there is some coloring with some pedals, right. but I don't think people really understand uh, a lot of where your tone is coming from, and frankly, uh, this is a little different than I saw a year or so ago, so this has changed a little bit since I think yeah. maybe two years ago. Well, the MXR has, uh, has always been here, the base of the eye. Yeah. I've tried a different, couple of different compressors just to even things out right but uh i just like this so yeah this is uh where a lot of the sound comes from right and uh so you like the compressed sound well i just um i go up high a lot right in fact justin carkett has cited me for above the 12th fret violations what <laughs> you're not supposed to do on on a bass guitar yeah no, no but when i do do those things right i do like them to be be there right and uh, that helps smooth that out sure a good bit but the, the good thing I like about this is when we are on, on big stages with big PAs you know we mic the 10 on this thing right but also run a direct right into this right. MXR right to the board yeah that gives that that sound man you know good a little bit of control yeah. over what he's getting from right in the front of the house yeah okay so how did you arrive here? Is this just something that just fell in your lap or did you go through some iteration of sound? Now, when we talked to Russ, Russ went through a lot of iteration, but, right. but Russ also was following a pretty iconic sound right. with respect to what he had to follow. Right. Now, now with the bass, did you go through any twiddling well, with, with different effects um, or did you come in and that was your sound from the get go? Uh, Tom used the, oh, we used the rat pedal. Mm -hmm. So I bought a rat pedal and, and I had a guy mod it for bass, just a little bit more low end. Right. And uh, it sounded good, but it didn't it didn't mesh well with this, I didn't think, right. this head. So I just took a gamble on that MXR. Uh -huh. And uh, man, it does it. I mean, I don't feel the need to experiment. Right. It does the job. Like I say, we don't need a lot of versatility. Um, and you know, I could over-examine the sound of this thing forever, and a lot of people do. You sure, know, they're constantly yeah. twiddling, and Absolutely. and I'm like, you know, it's good enough. This is what I got till something breaks. Right. So, Barry, thank you so much for taking time to walk through your musical journey, um, your uh, history with Anti Scene. I'm sure, I'm sure the fans love to hear that sort of stuff, as well as talking through your gear. A lot of gearheads out there just want to know how you get your sound. Appreciate you walking through all that with us. Um, thanks again. We really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>